Some days ago, the story broke of a police recruitment scam in Ghana. Some aspiring policemen and women were taken advantage of in their quest to join the service. They had been charged various sums of money and given forged letters, inviting them as recruits to undergo a six-month training course. In the course of the investigations, a top cop, COP Patrick Timbilla, Director of Human Resource and Administration, was fingered and promptly placed under house arrest by the police administration pending investigations. Now, as pandas condemn the whole affair, calls have also been made for an independent bipartisan investigation to be conducted in the whole matter. Such calls have at best been rebuffed by the Inspector General of Police as we learn of more arrests. On the line right now is perhaps the loudest advocate for the independent inquest into the matter. Dr. Kwesi Ening is head of department um, of research, I should say, at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, KAI PTC in Accra, Ghana. He's also an expert on common African defense and security policy and counter-terrorism. You're welcome to Sarah TV, sir. Uh, hello, Dr. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Good evening, sir. Thank you for making time with us. Aisha Asunda was fingered as the primary suspect uh, um, together with the 14 people that were arrested. Uh, however, as the, as the case progresses, uh, um, Chief uh, Police Officer Patrick Timbella has also been arrested or placed under house arrest, I should say. What has happened in between these two things? Can you fill us in, sir? Well, like, since the terror broke and the original or the initial arrests were made, we know that there is a task force that has been established that under the direct supervision of the Inspector General of Police. They subsequently then explained to us the new recruitment framework that contributed in one way or the other to the exposure of this scam. But interestingly also, we've been hearing the stories of the victims of the scam, explaining how the, they were acted and lured into paying these sums of money. But let me say this. I think there are considerably more questions than answers. Uh, um, my argument has been that since a task force has established to investigate how and what took place, and their report is expected on or around the 20th of March, um, you know, and they should be patient and wait for the report to come out. Nevertheless, because the report focuses on a very particular aspect of policing, that is the recruitment, it will not, that report would not be enough to deal with the, the institutional challenges faced by the Ghana police service. So there will still be the need for a bipartisan independent presidential commission mm. to look uh, at the police in Ghana as a whole. Okay, so let's stay on, on DCO Pitimbilla for a moment. When the initial story broke out, he, he actually made a statement and said that the, um, the, the, the culprits were actually going to be treated as suspects to deter yeah. other people from falling victim yeah. to that. Soon after that, he himself was named. Are you surprised? Yes, I'm surprised. Um, I'm surprised not just because he was very vocal about those who were supposed to be treated as culprits. And I think I had come on air to clarify that yes, they may have, people have, may have paid by to enter the service. That was legal and wrong. But it relates to the wider societal perception of the police as inherently corrupt and therefore an institution that one cannot in many ways than one enter legitimately except through the back door or mm. through a protocol list. And therefore the service itself had a responsibility to examine its institutional culture and its procedures for recruitment. Mm. 
Okay, so half I of the time. Mm. Yes, please go. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the speed with which COP Patrick Tribula was arrested, of course, they raised a couple of uh, surprises. Mm. But even more so, I'm waiting, and quite a number of Ghanaians are waiting to hear his version of this event. Okay. So far, everybody has been speaking against him and his role. But in democratic dispensation with the rule of law, I think it's only fair that we give. That we hear the other answer. side, for also sure. Yeah. So, so um, it's been alleged, the media reports that we are receiving um, indicate that these culprits were charged... Um, amounts that could be described as colossal in, in Ghanaian terms, at least. They were charged between uh, $1,500 and $2,000 each um, to, to enter into the police service. Is it that lucrative to, to be in the police service at all? To, I mean, to pay such amounts to get into? Well, I mean, yes, I think it's that lucrative. And it raises more fundamental structural questions about how much they thought they would earn over a period of time to make such an investment profitable. Yep. And that is why my argument is that irrespective of the conclusion that will be drawn by this task force, investigative task force, there are much bigger issues that we need to deal with. Because look, if you think that you can invest so much money by entering a, a public service institution, that is not profit making. Mm. Then we need to ask ourselves, how do you expect to make that money? And that will be made through a couple of means, of which the one is extortion of drivers as they travel and their passengers. Yeah. And this is something that has been discussed, identified, highlighted by some of Ghana's most credible uh, civil sector organizations, the Institute for Economic Affairs and the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. And every time these institutions and other civil society organizations have raised their voices and presented their research results, um, the police leadership has come out robustly to say, no, this is not right, that this is not correct. Mm. So the fact that they have interdicted one of their own at such a senior level um, raises issues of credibility and perception that I think, as Ghanaians, we need to help the police. To totally. Do. Because the police service is a really very important organization. And totally. Ghanaians want their police service to be effective and very uh, responsive. And clean, and clean as well. So still so, on, on the issue of corruption, um, the, the investigations um, are yet to, to be finished and all of that. So we still wait. But... We also know that, I mean, that's something that every Ghanaian should be able to tell you, how the police conduct their, their work. Um, we've seen a few times where police stop people and ask them for money. It could be different from other places where they actually do it under duress or anything like that. There was actually a viral video of a Ghanaian policeman literally begging for money from passengers and stuff like that. Yeah. Is this yeah. an ingrained... Thing in the in the police service at all. For instance, the Ghana Police Service has been um, fingered as one of the most corrupt institutions in Ghana. Do you share this point of view? No, what I mean, any Ghanaian who travels on our roads um, at one point or the other sort of has a fairly uncomfortable confrontation with the police. But there's certain contradictory aspects of the Ghana police services or the, the behavior of its personnel. When they do peacekeeping, I mean, they are one of the most decorated, or Ghana is one of the most decorated police contributing countries in the world. Mm. So there seems to be a certain lacuna as to how these same officers behave while they are on duty in Ghana and how they behave when they serve under the United Nations flag. Mm. And we need to break that lacuna because whilst countries, post-conflict countries where the police service have performed are full of praise, and as you correctly uh, indicated, that same amount of praise will not be obtained or has not been obtained in the last 10 to 12 years from any of the perception and, and corruption service 
that we have had in Ghana. Mm. Okay, so moving forward, the, you, you asked the IGP, I mean, or you didn't ask the IGP, you actually made a call for a bipartisan investigation into the matter. The IGP, however, yeah. insists that they would rather conduct an in-house investigation. How do you feel well, about this? Well, I mean, that is, I mean, that is expected. He wants to be seen in charge of this investigation, this massive organized criminal syndicate and scam has occurred under his watch. Um, so there's a certain bit of embarrassment, there's a certain bit of anger, and he wants to ensure that he brings it under control. So, so that is highly understandable. You would not... Never despair. Nevertheless, that will not resolve the problem. Mm. The problem is much bigger than the recruitment. And what this investigative team is doing is looking at the recruitment aspect of this car. Mm. Okay, so we need a much bigger, more important, uh, or more encompassing, let me say, um, more encompassing investigative or an inquiry team you know, beyond what is being done now. Okay, but so so let me throw this in. Argument, the, yeah. Let me throw this in. And there's been a bit of talk about um, Patrick Timbella being made a scapegoat, being uh, sacrificed because it does not look as if this is something that he or Aisha, um, Aisha, the Shenard Butter lady, can easily pull off by themselves. As a matter of fact, monies were paid into um, legitimate bank accounts and stuff like that. And Patrick Timbella's uh, signature was alleged to be on some of those letters. Do you smell the rat, doctor? Well, I think, I mean, I haven't seen those letters, but I, until and unless we hear uh, Patrick Timbella's side of the story, I think it would be hasty um, for anyone to raise suspicions about what is happening. Nevertheless, knowing Ghanaians and our national sport in being suspicious about everything. <laughs> um, one can hear, yes, you know, public concerns, raising, you know, some questions. There, there has, there, I, I listened to an interview with um, Reverend Ampabene, who is also one of the top cops in Ghana and a spokesperson for the yeah. police service, virtually yeah. stopping short of... Um, saying that the investigative team is convinced that the signature was actually um, um, Mr. Timbele's signature. We also have reports of one of the victims who, who actually said that when they got to the police depot, somebody said that it was Patrick Timbele's signature, so he is the one who should come and speak with them. However, he came, peeped through the window, and then left, sending another policeman to come and inform them that he had traveled. If you put these two together, I'm, I'm, you know, I missed the other pieces of information that we are gleaning outside of the actual investigation. Is it perhaps proper to start thinking that Patrick Timbala could be involved? No, I think we need, you see, it's only fair he's been interdicted, and it's only fair that we give him a voice. Because this story that you just recounted, um, I think raises more questions than casts, you know, light on this problem. You know, but my argument consistently has been about two things. People will always say what they want to say. But you see, we live in a democratic dispensation, and it is important that whoever has been accused is given a voice to express, to express their, their, their alibi. Okay, yeah. Dr. Enim, before we wrap up, though, let me see if I can push two very important questions more, one on this subject and one on another subject which we are following very closely. Um, the, the last question on this issue, though, is that as a security expert, what would be the implication? What do we have to fear from a situation where the police service is given a blank check to recruit. 
because in the in the uh, victim statement, she also mentioned that there was a political influence somewhere that the National Democratic Congress, as the ruling party, was behind it because they wanted to recruit police officers from their so-called strongholds. This story, however, I should mention, has been sort of rebuffed because there has, there has also been mention of uh, an opposition figure involved in this issue. General question, though, is, Doctor, how is this going to affect the security of Ghana and the sub-region? Well, I think it's important that the politicization of our security institutions must end. Now, there's just been a very fascinating new book written by a former head of Ghana's uh, military intelligence, uh, General Edouard Manfo, who argues very passionately in his book about the way that you know, political meddling in security services actually undermines the credibility and effectiveness of these services. And by extension, if you put in those who are not the best qualified to head these institutions, or you recruit too many people who would otherwise not get in, it undermines our ability to fight terror, for example. Mm. It undermines our ability to undertake crowd control. It undermines security ability to create that sense of, of of well-being that allows the economy to grow, that allows people to go about their daily business. So the long-term impact on the state itself is extremely negative, and it mm. undermines the credibility of people's livelihoods. So it's in our collective interest as West Africans to ensure that the panoply of rules and regulations that we have established to govern these secret institutions actually allowed to work because mm. it's for the benefit of all of us. Fantastic. And finally, doc, Dr. Enning, in nearby Nigeria, um, they're gearing up for elections. Um, this election is anything but ordinary against the backdrop of a very aggressive militant group who have sworn not to make the election happen. We also have, you know, in, internal problems with the INEC and all of that. As a security expert, again, Dr. Enin, what do you foresee happening in Nigeria? Well, um, I think it's going to be a tight election. Uh, knowing the history of losers in our electoral cycles in West Africa, the loser will cry foul. But I think it's key. I mean, Nigeria is way too important a country. Uh, for any untoward things to happen relating to his election. So I'm hoping that the COAS and the COAS chair and the wider international community are beginning to engage all the parties and stakeholders in Nigeria to accept the results and even if they have a complaint, do what happened in Kenya and Ghana. You know, go to court, use due process and to ensure that there is stability. Because look, where will Nigerians go? A couple of millions of them will come to Ghana, I guess, or try to come to Ghana um, and go to the other countries. But, you know, the majority of Nigerians have nowhere to go. So it's in their collective interest. And certainly as West Africa's absolute hegemon, in the collective interest of West Africans as a whole, you know, to hope for the very best and to encourage our Nigerian brothers and sisters. Um, to allow fair play to win on 28th of March. Okay, sir. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kwesienin, for your time and your insights. As we get ready to give our viewers a full, uninterrupted coverage of the Nigerian election, we definitely will be knocking on your doors again and calling on you to um, bring your insights to the whole discourse. Thank you so much for making time with us. Dr is the head of department for research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center in Accra, Ghana. Stay tuned, Sarah TV, there's more coming.